The expressed views, statements, and opinions by the guests on the Risk Advisor program made either during the show or on the corresponding social media and blog outlets are not necessarily the view or opinions of Baxter Productions, Inc. or any of its affiliates, associates, or others who are part of this production. Information provided during this broadcast is for news purposes only and does not constitute a remedy for any of the discussed risks presented. You ever wonder about spies and their bugging devices that they use? Are they real or do they only exist in the movies? We'll show you how real they are and how big a risk they can be today on the riskadvisor.com. The Risk Advisor. You're listening to the Risk Advisor broadcast. The Risk Advisor highlights topics about the most important personal security and safety issues today. This is for you, your family, and your loved ones. Experts alert to trends, tactics, and techniques used against us. You can be more aware and more informed to stay safe in this ever-changing, complicated place we call life. And now your host, media's go-to guy, Sal LaPriere. Welcome to the Risk Advisor podcast. We are with Charles Patterson, the president of Exec Security TSM. We will, today we want to talk about spies, how they bug their victims, and what people need to know not to become a victim. Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sal. So, before we even get into how you got into this, talk to me about bugging. Is this real? This is what the public wants to know. Bugging and spying has been around... Since the beginning of time, it seems. Um, a lot of people are more familiar with uh, movies from the Cold War era. But if you go online today, you'll see there are all sorts of devices available. Um, some that uh, may have legitimate uh, purposes, but yet they could also be used as a spy device. There's little, little things that you can get uh, as small as this that uh, can transmit audio. Uh, for almost up to a mile. There's other ones that uh, use cellular signals that you can listen in from anywhere in the world. And some of the some of the technology, when you look at something as, as small as this, I mean, this was, in today's standard, this is actually something that would be pretty large and sort of archaic. Uh, we were talking before, before we went on air about the availability of the devices today, one of which is actually on a business card with the raised print. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the type of the, the advances in technology and the miniaturization. So that's something that, um, something that's, it's the, I guess the general answer to the question is yes, it's real. Sure. I mean, if you look at how many things are being sold all the time online, somebody's buying them. Could be your neighbor, could be your coworker, could be your boss. You never know. Isn't that a problem, though, that they can, somebody can actually go online and buy them? It, it is. Back, I think it was back in the 70s, the FBI cracked down on on shops that were selling spy devices, but now I think it's so prevalent um, that th- it's out of control and they're not able to control it. Talk to us a little bit about hey, you got into this and how does how does somebody come into this? Were you, did you start as a tinkerer or what, what, how did it start? I've always been interested in electronics. I was a ham radio operator since I was a, a young kid, but I got into the um, security field um, over 40 years ago. Uh, Initially started as a guard and working for a uh, company that provided executive protection. But because I had uh, some aptitude with electronics, I started working with the two-way radios, with uh, uh, anything technical that came along back in those days, uh, and continued with that. I got to see uh, a few people coming in to do uh, sweeps to find devices uh, in the course of my work. Some of them were good. Some of them I realized didn't know what they were doing. So I thought, well, this is a very interesting field. So I started to pursue that myself and started my own business about over 20 years ago. So bug, the bug sweeping is is officially, or the technical term for it, is technical surveillance countermeasures. Correct. Right. Break that down for me a little bit. What does that really so mean? The initials TSCM, as you said, is technical surveillance countermeasures. I think the term originally uh, started in the military. But it's countermeasures or prevention techniques against technical surveillance. There's a lot of different types of surveillance. Uh, You being in the security field, you know uh, it's always good to pay attention if someone might be following you or or trying to uh, observe you. But technical surveillance 
could be using electronic means, it could be cameras, it could be microphones, it could even be sound being conducted through uh, open air vents, uh, walls that aren't uh, soundproofed, uh, many different ways that audio or video uh, it could be used against somebody. So we'll get into some of the more technical stuff in a little bit, but l let's talk about the need and why this becomes important. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why uh, people need to pay attention. Um, sometimes people think, well, I have I don't have anything to hide. But ultimately, as we see nowadays in the news, people are very concerned about privacy for things that they've put out online. Collect enough information and you may have uh, damaging information uh, to hurt somebody with. That's what you have to be careful about. Who, do you have enemies? Uh, are you in business? Do you have... Uh, other competitors who are trying to bid against you for a contract, um, or are you going through a legal battle? It could be, it could be worth millions of dollars in in a lawsuit. That might be enough to motivate someone to, to try to use some kind of uh, illegal surveillance against you. Most people in you know, are concerned about online stuff and you know whether you know identity theft and credit monitoring and and worrying about those issues. This doesn't always seem to rise to that same level of concern. Right? I mean, the way I see it, you got there's a couple of different levels of it. There are people that are totally oblivious, and then you got people that wind up, you know, being concerned about maybe what's online or their credit monitoring, identity theft, and then you have you know the people that are really concerned about all three of the above. You know, they they they, they realize that hey, we I may have a problem here. Do you see that more in the corporate side or on the private side? The more serious concerns are on the corporate side. If you think in terms of uh, other types of security or protective measures for your home or for your business, if you have a, a business in a bad part of town where there's a lot of crime going on every day, you're going to have extra care, uh, maybe bars on your windows, uh, you know, roll down gate on your door. If you're out in the country in a comfortable place, maybe you don't, but you still lock your door. If you're a bank, on the other hand, and you have a lot of money there, then you're going to take extra steps. So a lot ha has to do with what you see uh, as the risk. What's the, um, what's the potential damage that could be done if you've lost some information? So what winds up happening on the, on the personal, I mean, the business side, we get it, right? International espionage, uh, intellectual property theft, we get all of that. On the private side, you know, on the personal side, how much of this is actually done either for embarrassment or, you know, what, what are the, I guess the, the simpler question here is what's the personal motivation? It could be, it, it could be embarrassment. Uh, to do a, a effective surveillance of someone, it takes a good bit of effort. So um, it's not usually someone randomly just trying to, uh, harass you but you know there are there are cases like that if you're like i said if you're in a lawsuit um, a matrimonial case um, a child custody case there could be a lot of reasons why someone may want to for instance keep tabs on what their kids are doing put a uh, if they're not allowed back in the house maybe the uh uh, the, the spouse may want to try to spy on what's going on in the house or, the, he, or hear the conversations with the, uh, their other spouse and their attorney. And that, that's a whole other area about, and uh, hopefully we'll get some time and get into it later, to talk about the, the people that put devices in to monitor maybe the nannies or something like that, how they wind up bugging themselves. Uh, this is true, too. Uh, in a number of cases where we've gone to, to check a, uh, a home, we'll find they may have a baby monitor that, that is not a secured device and it's transmitting a signal that could be picked up out on the street. Well, I think this, the ease and simplicity of how these things occur and what, you know, how, how available it is, and we'll get into this in a little bit uh, when we get back from a quick break. But when we get back, what we really want to do is we want to talk about the countermeasures that are available for you, things that you can do to protect yourself from stuff that's just readily available online. Workplace violence, terrorism, identity theft, cyberbullying, and stalking. It's not a matter of if they will happen, it's a matter of when. The security world is too complicated to do it alone. You need a security advisor. Call Protective Countermeasures now. Protective Countermeasures has been providing security consulting to Fortune 500 companies for nearly 20 years. Call today. 
914-576-8706, protectivecountermeasures.com. You are watching the riskadvisor.com vodcast. We're back with Charles Patterson, the president of Exec Security TSCM, talking about eavesdropping, wiretapping, and the risk that we're facing. Let's talk about countermeasures. What the, let's start going through some of the steps about, you know, most people's perception of countermeasures when they bring in somebody to do a sweep is a guy that walks around the room with a magic wand. Right. Right. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, as, we're, as we were talking earlier, uh, if you go back in, in a number of years, um, there weren't that many radio signals being used. So a small, simple radio um, detector, what might be called a broadband detector, might be very helpful uh, to walk around a room with. And you would see in, the, in maybe old movies, somebody walking around like that looking for a signal. But today... There's tons of radio signals everywhere, from your cell phone to light switches to uh, Bluetooth devices, all types of things. So um, you're going to need to discern, you know, what's what's authorized, what isn't authorized, what's significant, what isn't. Um, but as we mentioned before, it's not just radio signals. There could be recorders. There could be other other types of things. Um, well, even one of the one of the, the things that we had. Back in my law enforcement days, when when we were involved with devices like this, uh, was the old snuggle bug, where you would you'd have a frequency on a radio that would be a predominant radio station, and you'd set the device to be able to transmit just a little bit off that frequency, so that when someone was coming in, if they came in due to sweep with the magic wand, what they would do is they'd pick up that main frequency and say, oh, was, that's just the main frequency." Right. And not catch a and not catch a snuggled underneath that something that was right that, nearby that was, that was coming out. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the main tools today is a spectrum analyzer. Um, they there's quite a variety out there. Most of them have some type of uh, computer control, but you use the spectrum analyzer shows you a graphic display of every signal within a frequency range that that you can see. So, for instance. When we look at the FM broadcast band, we may see a, a signal pops up for 95.5, but you have to look and see, are there signals on either side of it? Um, and understand technology, understand stereo signals today will have some other parts that can be seen, but you have to look, is there anything else that's there that doesn't look uh, like it belongs? Um, and there are other types of transmitters as well that can use uh, spread spectrum where it's the signals spread across a lot of frequencies. Uh, digital devices that you, even if you f see the signal and you listen to it, you're not going to be able to to know what's being uh, transmitted. And in a lot of ways, what winds up happening is, you know, a lot of the things that you wind up looking for in the sweep is it. I've, I've always equated this to software like spyware on computers and virus protection. You don't have virus protection built to prevent the virus from coming in. What they wind up doing is you have virus protection that actually identifies the virus on your computer. Correct. So it was in similarly similar fashion here. You had technicians and engineers that were able to get incredibly um, resourceful and come up with different techniques. And that's why we always had to learn what was those techniques, what were those things that they were doing today, and how do you beat them? How do you countermeasure it? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was that I found that I really enjoyed playing with was thermal imaging. Mm -hmm. And it, talk to us about thermal imaging. Thermal imaging is a real valuable tool. Um, it allows you to look at, for instance, a wall or part of a ceiling, and you um, see differences in temperature. If everything is the same uh, color or shade, for instance, everything's pretty much the same temperature. But something that's hot will show up. Something that has heat in it. Uh, for instance, it's used, uh, a lot of people know it's used for checking your home for insulation to see, you'll see if there's a poor insulation in your wall, you'll also see where heating pipes run. What we uh, use it for often is finding hidden cameras. Cameras in general uh, create a lot of heat. Just the circuitry that powers a camera uh, gets very hot. So if a camera was up in a ceiling tile and you look at that with a, a thermal camera, very well, you could see um, a hot spot there.
And then you want to check it out and see what it is. Maybe it's something else. Maybe there's uh, some other heating device or something up there. Or show it in a wire that's about to go kaboom. It could yeah, be. You know, yeah. But you want to check it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talk to us about some of the uh, equipment that you use. So we mentioned spectrum analysis. We mentioned uh, thermal imaging. One of the uh, key devices uh, or tools that we use is called a nonlinear junction detector. Now, a nonlinear junction, that's just a long word for a diode or a piece of uh, electronic circuitry. Uh, you know, microprocessor chip or, or any, the diode is the basis of a transistor. The uh, NLJD, for short, um, can detect the presence of electronic circuitry, even if it's not turned on. It, it kind of beams out uh, like a little radar signal and looks for a reflection from that. Uh, it, it can find electronics that might be hidden within a book, uh, something hidden behind a wall. Of course, if you're, if you're trying to look at a stereo system on, your, on, your, on a shelf, the nonlinear junction detector is going to hit on that, so you still have to use other tools. One of the the ways I view it is every tool is adding another layer of like a web or a screen. The more layers you add, the tighter the, the holes get in the screen, and it makes it harder and harder for something to slip through. With about a minute to go, does the average person, is there anything they can do? That is uh, actually a good topic because there are a number of things that people can do on their own. All the tests that we do, all of the sophisticated electronics, where we're using you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of test equipment, when we find something peculiar, you know, if the nonlinear junction detector is getting a hit on a corner of a table, uh, if the thermal imaging sees something in the ceiling, we still have to go and look for it. We still have to search it out and find out why you know what's causing this this anomaly. Um, the, a basic physical inspection is a great way to start. To if you have concerns about your office or your or your home or even a home office, for instance, uh, if you've had you know maybe uh, cleaners or workers in there, start by looking around physically. Looking is there anything out of place? Is there anything that you don't recognize? Uh, cell phone charger, are they yours? Are you sure that it's the one that you? bought and that someone hasn't substituted and brought in a different one that might actually well, be a actually, spy device. Well, actually, we got a sample with us, right? Uh, right. A different device. Something that could look as simple as a, a basic uh, iPhone charger or a cell phone charger. Uh, this one looks very uh, simple, but this one actually has a transmitter built in that is a cellular transmitter. You can dial into it from any place in the world and listen to the room audio coming through. And there are other ones with, with cameras. This is, almost looks identical. Uh, but this one has a camera in the front and a microphone in the back, and as soon as it's plugged in, it starts recording. These are things that are readily available. Uh, Plus, it also works as a dev as it's and an it charges, intended device, and, and it charges your, your phone, phone yeah. as well. <laughs> so you know they're sold as security devices. So yes, for instance, if you want to make sure no one's coming into your office when you're uh, when you're away, you could plug one in. But they're also available for you know malicious means to we're going to take a quick break when we come back we're going to talk a little bit more about tips and some of the techniques that you can use to protect yourself we'll be right back from the files of new york detective frank santasola a riveting murder mystery novel the garbage murders after an illicit liaison with his mistress the owner of a private sanitation company in new york is murdered Enter the life of Detective Frank Miranda, one of a few men in law enforcement to infiltrate the Italian mob and bring to justice some of the biggest names in organized crime history on Amazon Books in paperback and Kindle editions. TheGarbageMurders.com You're watching the Risk Advisor Vodcast, and we're back with Charles Patterson, president of Exec Security TSCM. And we're talking about eavesdropping and wiretapping and some of the things that you can do to protect yourself. Some of the tips that uh, we can go over now. So what do we got? Well, an important thing is to understand uh, the value of your information and your conversations. As we spoke about earlier in the episode, uh, if you're in business, uh, you need to pay serious attention to this because uh, a little bit of information, whether it could be uh, that you're going to be hiring and firing you know, somebody, maybe a, a, a colleague or another executive uh, is, is getting the idea they may be out of a job. That's a, con that's a concern. Uh, by understanding what's important, then you can understand how to be careful. The old, the old adage from the Cold War days, loose lips sink ships. If 
you, you may be talking to a friend who you trust, but they don't realize the importance of the information. So they could be passing that on. Say, by the way, do you know what so and so said? You know, and they don't realize that that information then could be, you know, traveling down the line and could come back and hurt you. Well, you know, in in our world, from and I came out of the intelligence world, so in, in our world, everything is intelligence. And you know, one of the one of the things, if you ever want to, if you ever want to get a true story about an event that occurred. One of the simplest things to do is go out and get yourself three or four different newspapers or nowadays online, go online and get three or four different stories. And I'm not talking about just the AP feeds. What I'm talking about is like, you know, maybe the Times, the Post or mm -hmm. you know, a local paper or whatever. Get three or four different written stories and put them down next to each other and read through them. And what you'll find is that there are different elements in each part of it that were covered that one reporter didn't cover or a couple of them didn't cover and only one guy picked up. And when you start putting it, when you start doing it line by line and putting the facts down, you find out that, wow, there was a bunch of things here that, you know, this is, this is a slightly different story. You could, so you could see what really happened, right. right? That's how classified reports wind up getting written, but. That happens in business a lot too, where a little bit of information gets collected and they put it together. I mean, there's a, a legitimate, uh, you know, business, um, uh, segment of comp uh, you know competitive intelligence, just collecting intelligence on your competitors. Nothing illegal about it, um, but it, somebody might be prompted to try and gather information through some illegal means, and that also could be a be a concern. So, what about policies, protocols? That's important, important. That's important for any business. Um, the policies help the employees to understand that. What they're talking about on a daily basis in the office is significant and it is important. Uh, there's also a, a concern if you have trade secrets, uh, you have to take steps to protect them. If someone walks away, walks out of your office and passes on a little information that they overheard, or if someone's uh, recording some information that they shouldn't be, if, if you want to claim that that's a trade secret, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate in court that you took steps to protect it. Countermeasures is one of those, uh, technical countermeasures is one of those steps to help protect your information. So we talk about, you know, things that, you know, what should people be looking for? And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we talk about is, you know, has furniture been moved or has, has something been disturbed? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that that's something that when we would go in to plant devices, uh, first thing we would do is take pictures of everything. We'd take the Polaroid camera and start taking snapshots of everything so that in the course of moving stuff around and planting something in, that you'd be able to look at the picture and make sure that everything was back where it where it's supposed to yeah. be. And you'll know how hard it is, and you could easily slip and miss something. Uh, if, uh, if you find some dust on your desk that looks like it, it came from a ceiling tile being moved, well, that, that, could be a, that could be an indication of a problem, or maybe not. Um, if uh, furniture was moved, you know, you, you have a chair and furniture on your carpet, they leave indentations. If you come in one day and you see that it's been moved and the indentations aren't where they used to be, well, th there may be a concern. A valuable aspect of that is having closed-circuit video cameras, security cameras, in your business because that's one way to see has something been going on oh if there was what happened was it just a cleaner came in or was someone unauthorized uh, in your home or your facility and in general i mean it, it for the most part people are pretty much oblivious to their surroundings right? i mean we we talk about right. situational awareness and people having situational awareness knowing what's going on around them um, you know especially when you're talking about being in home you kind of get comfortable with your surroundings and especially if there's a couple of people living there, then you know you just sort of you discount a right. lot, mm -hmm. and you don't realize what you know, what's happening. What are some of the ways people recognize that they're being they're being bugged? You know, or they think that there's been a compromise, maybe not bugged, but a compromise. Information getting out or coming back to you through the wrong channels. Uh, we were called by a pharmaceutical company one time, and they have a department that monitors online blogs because in, in almost any industry there are blo blogs for employees and people who work in those industries and all of a sudden they see something talking of someone talking about their company referencing some information that was not public information 
So now they want to know how did that get out? What happened? They have to start to figure out, well, who did I talk to? Who shared, who was this information shared with? Who knew about it? Where did discussions take place? And, uh, you know, that's an important, an important clue. And th those are part of the things that, you know, it's not necessarily having, you know, a, uh, a nonlinear junction detector is going to find that for you, right? Correct. It's all part of the, the awareness and the, the ability to look for physical. With the advent of devices being smaller and smaller and smaller, um, obviously they got to look closer and closer. But covert cameras today, how small of a hole do you really have to be looking for, and is there any trick that you can to see if you can determine if there's a camera? The the challenge with cameras is, yes, the, the, the hole can be very small for a, a camera to see through. But on the other end, there has to be some circuitry. The camera has to connect to something. One of the techniques that we use is thermal imaging, but you may not have that available. If you see a hole um, that you are concerned about, you think, hey, that hole is, I don't recall that being there before, and you want to find out if there's a camera in it, a, t a simple technique is to hold a flashlight, hold it near your head so you're looking straight on line with the light. If you see a reflection coming back, that means there's something in there that's reflecting the light. Maybe it's just a piece of metal from the stud in the wall. It could be a camera, though, and then you can start to figure out where does that hole go? Is it just in a ceiling tile? Is it in a wall? Does it lead to another room? Um, you know, and you can start to uh, pursue that. There are devices you can buy. You know, one of them is an inexpensive thing called the Spy Finder. It lets you look through the center hole and flashes some uh, LEDs. It's the same principle, but you can do the same thing with a flashlight uh, if you're careful and you pay attention. I have a definitive opinion about this. I'd love to hear your opinion about it. So someone walks into the spy shop or, you know, a store that's that's selling these gizmos or goes online. What's your opinion about somebody that wants to buy the equipment and do the search themselves? The challenge is that you have to understand what it is you're looking for. If you're buying a small receiver that's go, going to light up if it detects a radio signal, you, you have to know what kind of signals you're going to be finding. If you hold it near a tissue box and you're getting a radio signal coming out of a tissue box, well, you got something to think about there. But just walking around the room and picking up signals, there could be a radio station, a broadcast station, uh, you know, half a mile down the road, uh, somebody driving by, a taxi on a two-way radio, or somebody with a cell phone. All these things could <clears throat> create a paranoia that isn't necessary. For those that aren't crazy, that really that really want you to have a good service. <laughs> well, our, our website is execsecurity.com, E-X-E-C security.com. On there, I have a blog, uh, contact information, um, and you can learn a lot about uh, electronic countermeasures there as well. We have a lot of different uh, explanations and descriptions of equipment and things like that. Great. Well, I can tell you I've, I've had a relationship with Charles for a number of years and have used them in a number of cases that I've had. Um, and I don't think that you're ever going to be dissatisfied with, uh, with the professionalism and the service that you're getting from him. So I'd strongly suggest that if you have a need, you pick up the phone and you call him. I'd like to remind you that if you do have a question or a comment about the show or you want to write and talk to us, Feel free to get to us at guest at theriskadvisor.com. You can follow us on our social media accounts, and you can find that link at our website at theriskadvisor.com. We'd like to say one more time, thank you, Charles, for coming, and we Pleasure. hope to see you next week. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you have any questions, would like to appear on the program, or recommend a guest, contact us at theriskadvisor.com. Stay safe and join us again next week for another episode of The Risk Advisor.